So I went up to him and I, during the break, and I said, uh, Grandmaster Dillman, I really enjoyed that session, but I'm having a hard time buying the whole pressure point knockout thing. And he popped me on my jaw. My feet popped out from underneath me and my butt hit the floor. Good day to you. This is episode 118 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, home to the best stories from the best martial artists. Like our guest today, Concho Matt Brown. At Whistlekick, we make the world's best sparring gear, and here on Martial Arts Radio, we bring you the web's top podcast on the traditional martial arts twice a week. Welcome. My name is Jeremy Lesniak, and I'm the host and founder of the company, Whistlekick. Thank you to the returning listeners, and welcome to those of you checking us out for the first time. If you're new to the show or our great products, please have a look at our sparring gloves. Easily the most durable foam glove on the market. It also has the most airflow and is extremely comfortable because of the high quality foam we use. Available in several colors now, you can find our gear at whistlekick.com or on Amazon. If you want the show notes, including photos and links to everything we talk about today with Concho Brown, you can find those at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. If you're not on the newsletter list, please sign up. We send out exclusive content, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. As a thank you for joining, we'll send you our top 10 tips for martial artists, an exclusive podcast episode. Sign up for the newsletter at any of the Whistlekick websites. I first met Concho Brown at a multi-instructor seminar in early of summer 2016. I was impressed with his skill, but more so his personality. We quickly became friends, and I found myself thrilled at his stories and his great sense of humor. I knew he was someone that needed to come on the show, and we spent a few months coordinating schedules, but he's here now, and it's time for his tales. Let's welcome him to the show. Conjo Brown, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's great to have you here. Looking forward to this. Of course, we've we've talked about doing this for a little bit, and I'm glad that we finally made the schedules work. Definitely. Definitely. So I I, I appreciate your time. Um, But, you know, let's, let's jump in. All right. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, I actually started martial arts for the the pretty traditional reason that people start. I was being bullied. <laughs> um, my father was a civilian contractor for the military. So we actually lived in Korea. And, uh, you know, over in Korea, they teach Taekwondo as gym class. And as a four and a half year old American kid in a foreign country, I was getting my butt kicked on a regular basis. So was my brother. My brother was about four years older than me. So my father basically said, you guys are going to learn how to protect yourselves. So we mm-hmm. went to the dojo on the base that he was, that he worked at. And, uh, yeah, it was an interesting class because classes were four to five hours long, depending on how long you could like basically handle it. And it was 55 GIs and 15 family members. And I was the youngest. So I was way in the back of the class and I was just basically supposed to be uh, seen but not heard and just do what I was supposed to do. So the only day we didn't train was Sundays and we lived there for two and a half years and then we moved back to the States. And then uh, very shortly thereafter, my teacher's name was uh, Koishin Nam. We brought him over to the United States. He lived outside of Boston and uh, very traditional martial arts instructor. Uh, opened a dojo in his garage, which a lot of guys did back in the, this, you know, the early seventies. And, uh, that's how we trained. And for a while, my parents would schlep me almost an hour's drive each way, three times a week to train with him. And then over time, it just got to be too time consuming, too expensive. So I would literally be dropped off on a Friday, stay there Friday night, and then Saturday spend the whole day training. And then I would be left to my own devices to work on that material. So that when I came back the following Saturday, I better know the material that he showed me or be at least have, you know, a grasp of it. Otherwise, it was months before he would show me anything else. Um, yeah, I forgot three moves out of a, out of a kata one time. And he refused to teach me those three moves. Told everybody in the dojo that they were not allowed to teach me those three moves. So I had to go to somebody who did the style that we did, which was Tong Sudo. Um, I had to go outside of the basically the dojo to learn those three moves to that kata. So, yeah, because it was disrespectful of me not to uh, give him my atten- my full attention and time. That's how he felt. But he was very much a father figure to me. He was very much 
um, somebody who was the the positive that kind of um, cancels out the negative, so to speak. So um, very tumultuous childhood. My father was a, an extremely extremely big man, extremely abusive verbally and physically to the whole entire family. And, uh, you know, basically would tell all his kids that we're losers and we couldn't do any good. Nothing was good enough. So to have that positive figure along with my mom, uh, canceled out what he did to me, because I think if I didn't have those, it probably would be different path, different person. I, I swear to this day, I probably would not be talking to you right now because I'd probably be dead or in jail. So that was my, my upbringing. And, uh, he died when I was 26 years old, um, with stomach cancer. He liked the soju a little too much. Um, and, uh, so I kind of wandered around for a few years trying to find a new teacher. And I came across, uh, the big three, 1998 came across the big three, which was professor Remy Price's professor Wally J and professor George Dillman. And I've been with Professor Dillman since then and have trained a lot with Professor Praces, a lot with Professor Jay, and just a whole bunch of other teachers. Um, to me, now everyone's my teacher. I, there's something to learn of value from every person, even if that person gets up and teaches something that you absolutely don't agree with and that you think is absolute garbage or whatever then you've learned what your, your vision of absolute garbage is. So you still have learned from that person. So, you know, and that's one of the big keys. I think that professor Dillman like hammered into my brain was that we need to be open-minded. We need to be exploratory. We need to research. We need to constantly be learning and improving. And, you know, for what it's worth, you know, there are people in the martial arts world that I don't care for. But there are things that I can find within them that I like, hey, that's something I agree with. And that's something that brings value to what I do. So, you know, then and, and to me, that's what martial arts is about. Yes, it's about fighting. It's about defending ourselves because that's what I got in it for. I fell in love with the fact that now I could defend myself and protect myself. But then I started to fall in love with the things that I could make my body do. But then I started to fall in love with the things that I could make my mind do. And then I fell in love with just the whole thing that it's a never ending learning process. And it just it enhanced and, and magnified every aspect of my life. And I mean, so I'll be a student for life. That's I was just recently asked, you know, when are you ever going to stop doing this martial arts stuff? I'm like, when I in the ground you know even if even if i'm like bedridden it's still you can still read you can still research you can still learn history i'm always fascinated by martial arts history some of the best lessons i've ever got have been sitting around with some of the old old time masters and old time practitioners and just listening to the stories you know so and if you really look back on some of these these old masters, the ones that really excel, the ones that are really out there, they got some pretty interesting life stories. So, and here you can see the inspiration for this show. Yes, <laughs> I mean literally right there because I feel the exact same way that you know hanging around after a promotion or or at a camp, you know, some kind of weekend event, that those stories were just the best. And and I really became frustrated having to wait so long and in between hearing these stories. And I said, you know, I bet we can turn this into a show. So that was the format. And yeah. I'm glad I'm not the only one. Some of these guys so, have lived some yeah. pretty amazing, fascinating lives. They absolutely have. You know, so some of them make me jealous. Some of them I'm like, well, I wouldn't <laughs> want to, wouldn't want to be you, but you know, that's, <laughs> that's what it is. And you know, every person that walks into a martial arts dojo has a story. You know, some of them are interesting. Some of them are not. I mean, I have a a young man. He just went into the military, into the army, graduated from high school. So he first watched his four year old next door neighbor get run over by a truck. Oh my God. And then the next year watched his father overdose in the middle of his living room. And for I say for the first 
four years he trained with me, he wouldn't even look me in the eye. He was just so shy and so meek. And to see him still be this big hearted, kind kid who excelled at everything to, you know, to the point where he was so focused on getting A's on everything in school that he just did that. And then so when he went into the army, he basically had his pick of what he wanted to do. And now from what I've been told by his mom, he's highly successful in the army, you know? So, I mean, there's a story that kid could have did martial arts change his life. I'd like to believe so. Um, could it had, did it save his life? I'd like to believe so. Could he have gone the wrong direction? Absolutely. You know, I think we, sometimes I think that you can have a story that's a negative story and you can have so much negative, negative things coming in that, but it can be one thing, one thing that happens that changes your whole compass and you go in a completely different direction than what life basically, you know, basically should have guided you that way. That makes yeah. sense. It does. Absolutely. And one of the things I've always felt is that people, human beings, we tend to learn a lot more from mistakes, from doing things wrong. Because when you do something right, it says, okay, this is an option. This can, this way can work in these circumstances. But when you do something that doesn't work, you can really put an X over that direction, that path and say, this is not the right way. And I think that we as people tend to resonate more in that way with, by excluding things and, and being left with, you know, what, whatever's left. Right. And that, that's the stuff that we do, the path that we follow as long as it works for us, as long as we've been taught that. Cause like when you use a childhood thing, my brother, uh, was on a sled when we were kids sliding down the hill and went headfirst into a tree. <laughs> okay. Now I ask, I quite often use this story as an example in my class and I ask my kids, I say, if you're on a sled and you're heading towards a tree, what do you do? And they say, well, we turn and we jump off. He not only did it once, he did it twice twice okay so he obviously didn't learn that that was not the right action that if you're not learning hey this doesn't work it will find ways to let you know that you know is it'll make you pay attention just like pain in the body so yeah we, we basically we teach the students in the dojo you got to be fearless you got to be not in that you know not afraid of doing anything but you got you got to be not afraid of making mistakes because we make mistakes all day long. That's part of just being a human. And if, as long as we learn from them, they're not failures. They're just mistakes. And it, it's actually a good thing because now, like you said, we've learned the correct course of action in what we should do as opposed to what we shouldn't do. And I think a lot of times the world ridicules us. Oh, you made a mistake. You slipped up. I mean, good example. I'm a pressure point guy. So a lot of times we use acupuncture terminology. And God forbid, if you say the wrong number on a meridian, there's someone out there in the audience who goes, ah, he must not know what he's doing because that's not lung six, that's lung seven or something like that. It's like, you know what? You've got a million things going through your head when you're standing up there trying to teach. If you if that's the mistake you make is a technicality, and that's what we're judging our opinion on of other people's martial arts skills, man – that's we got to go back and reanalyze ourselves because, you know, we all make mistakes again and persons can make mistake. Now, the only mistake that I really care about in martial arts, there's only two, actually one, the mistake that gets me injured or two, the mistake that gets someone else injured. That's it. You know, the rest of it is all just learning. I mean, I love uh, what is one of the Gracie's has a saying and I love it. If you're not winning, you're learning. Mm. Love that saying like that. that 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 basically encapsulizes that whole long discussion I just had in one phrase. Really, yeah. that's yeah. what it is. I, I grew up in a school that taught everyone has something to teach. You can learn something from everyone, even if it's a white belt on their first day. And what you may learn is, you know, you 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 have to watch out for getting kicked in the knee or you know something ridiculous, something that you wouldn't have expected if you've been training a while. And I think that that idea that everyone has something to teach, if, if we look at that, you know, cause of course we, we, before we started recording, we were 
chatting about martial artists cutting each other down mm. and and how that doesn't really work for either of us. And what would martial arts look like if instead of trying to find the things that others are doing wrong or different, we're looking for the things that people are doing of value? Yeah. You know, where, where would we be? Would, would martial arts have half the participation as a, as a population that it does globally in the United States? Probably not. No. We'd probably have more. And I think a lot of it is that culture that has led to bullying and so many of the other things that. And, you know, that the Dillman organization gets a lot of <laughs> a lot of negative, a lot of negative critiquing, which is fine. I mean, that's that's every organization gets that. But one of the things that a lot of people I don't think know or understand is that that's one of the main philosophies of the Dillman organization, DKI, is that we have that mentality that you can learn something from anyone. Even a white belt will show, might show you something that maybe it's not that you learned a technique from them, but they showed you something that clicked an idea or an, or or a or a, a technique or something in your head. It just sent you on a track towards finding an answer. And the, one of the fastest ways you get kicked out of our organization is to not share knowledge throughout the whole, or, the whole organization. Professor Dillman will say it numerous times. If you've ever been to one of his seminars, he'll say, a lot of times I see guys get up and they do a technique. And he goes, I, wouldn't, I didn't think of that technique or it's not something that I would do. But he goes, I learned from it. He goes, I picked up an idea. Or sometimes he'll just say, hey, you know, that's a really good technique. I'm going to steal that. And, you know, Professor Wally J used to always say, though, it's not stealing, it's sharing. Because one time at a seminar, some guy came up to Professor Wally J and said, hey, I just came from the other room. Professor Raymond Price is over there teaching and he's stealing your stuff. And Wally said, yeah, we call that sharing. You know, and some of that, I mean, that's an ego thing. When you won't mm. share your knowledge with a fellow martial artist because you're afraid that they might get better than you or that they might outshine you or that they might best you. I mean, I understand back in the day, you know, in feudal Japan or whatever, you didn't want the guy, your enemy to learn that stuff because then he could defeat you and kill you and take over your, your dojo or your village or whatever. But we're not in that kind of <laughs> right. era anymore, you know, and. It's like with every single thing, if we collectively put our knowledge together, we could move so far forward and create such amazing innovations and discoveries than if we just kind of keep ourselves separated, you know? Absolutely. I'll tell you, I was the biggest, the biggest, biggest naysayer and not a proponent of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I did not want to learn it. I did not want to do it. I used to even stick to the, well, I'll never go to the ground. That's, I'm so good. That's what I want to do. I want to work too long and just never go to the ground. It's a reality. It's going to end up happening. So I've been probably for the last nine years now studying Brazilian jiu-jitsu. I still suck at it. I still, and I love, love that I suck at it because here's another avenue, another skill set that I got to work on. And, you know, that's, that's, so Martial arts is, made, my opinion, martial arts is made up of skill sets. Good example. There are a lot of people out there that are ranking people in Q show, in the pressure points. Q show is not an art. It's a skill set within the martial arts. Okay. That's like me giving people a um, rank in arm bars. It's a skill. It's a technique. It's a skill set. So we're not, we shouldn't be, in my opinion, ranking people in or they shouldn't be saying on their websites i'm a you know blah 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 degree black belt in q show you know there's an art that you're that you're incorporating that skill set into that's your art you hold your rank in right you know so i don't even know where i went with that tangent <laughs> that's okay you know what and it, but that's fine that's know, good stuff so, and you know, Please. I train in BJJ. I, I love it. It's something new for me to learn. It's something that I can continue to learn and continue to suck at. And I love the fact that I suck at it because now there's a whole bunch of people that that opens the door for me 
to go study with and learn from. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's something we've talked about on this show too, that, you know, your first art, you know, generally black belt, you know, second, third degree, whatever, you're going to get the the core of your martial right. arts perspective. And yeah, continuing to train in that style will add, will make you a better martial artist. But there comes a time where you're going to receive more benefit by training in something completely different. I always make the analogy to all my students and, and when, even when I teach at seminars that martial arts, your, your original martial arts style, martial arts are like mechanics, okay? When you start a job as a mechanic, you have a generic toolbox that will basically have the tools that will take care of the primary jobs that you're going to run into. But once in a while, you run into a job that you don't have the tool for. You don't go out and buy a whole nother toolbox. You just buy the tool you need to do that job and add it to your toolbox. So in the future, you now have that tool. I look at martial arts the same way. My primary style is my toolbox. Now I'm adding the tools from other martial arts that my style does not address or, or whatever. So now I have that in my toolbox. So, you know, a lot of times, what, what's the number one question people ask you when you tell them you do martial arts? Oh, what, what style do you do? Well, I think there comes a time as a martial artist, if you're like, especially a lifelong martial artist, you transcend, you transcend that boundary of style and now you're just a martial artist. Because, you know, Professor Price used to say it's all the same. It is all the same. He used to say that if you mastered one style, then you could master them all if you applied what you learned in that one style. Because let's face it, if we strip everything away, kicks, punches, all that stuff, martial arts styles all have the same, basically have the same concepts and principles. And the rest of it is just someone's opinion on how they would deal with a physical confrontation that works for them, their body style, their body type, their mentality, their temperament, everything. Yeah. Yeah. So. I agree. So that gives us a lot of context for you and for who you are. And that's fantastic. Um, yeah, we were still on question one. If, <laughs> if anyone out there didn't realize that we, we almost had a great segue into question two, but we kept going. So we're going to, we're going to move on and, you told us some fantastic stories in there, but I'd like you to tell us your best one now. What's what's your best martial arts story? <laughs> My best martial arts story. Oh, geez. There, there's a lot of them. Some I can't divulge <laughs> <laughs> for legal reasons. No. Um, I, <laughs> so, I, I think that'll come in the paid version of this episode, right? Yes, exactly. Forty nine ninety five. You get to hear all the all the stories that you we know, can't tell. There, there's been so many moments that I can't really define the best, but you know, like I can tell you like a good example, my introduction to professor Dolan. All right. So I go to us, the seminar and it's Wally J, Remy Prices and George Dolan. Remy Prices comes up first and he is just going a thousand miles an hour with, uh, this guy with the sticks. And I turned to my student that I brought with me and I said, oh, that's really cool. But we just don't walk around carrying sticks. That's how close minded I was. Okay. So next up came Professor Dillman. And I actually went because I wanted to see Wally J. Because I had had a couple surgeries and I couldn't do the jumping flying kicks that I love to do. And I'm like, you know what? I want to be able to, because this is the other component that we need to be mindful of when we train in martial arts. We do the things that we enjoy, but if we're doing it for self-defense, okay, we spend a lot of time, a lot of money to train. Are we going to be able to have those skills and be able to do those skills when we're going to need them in our moonlight years of life? You know, when we're 70, 80 years old and now we are another target for, you know, people that want to rob us or whatever, violence or whatever. Are we going to be able to do that? And I was, I'm like, no, reasonably, I can't jump up and do a jump turning hook kick to some guy's head when I'm 75 years old. It'd be awesome if I could, but. I mean, I'm, I'm 47 years old and I'm already a physical wreck. So, um, so, you know, he, Professor Dillman started doing moves out of katas that I've been doing for years, using the pressure points, doing the grappling, the two a and dropping guys, biggest guys in the audience screaming and like, ah, that's interesting. Now I did, I had studied a Korean martial art called Kuk Sul that used acupuncture points 
but it was more I poke you here, it hurts. I grab you here, it hurts. You know, not that this point releases a muscle or, or a joint, and that type of techn technology or technical knowledge. So he started tapping guys and making them pass out. And I totally didn't buy it. Totally didn't buy it. So I went up to him and I, they're in a break and I said, uh, Grandmaster Dillman, I really enjoyed that session, but I'm having a hard time buying the whole pressure point knockout thing. And he popped me on my jaw. My feet popped out from underneath me and my butt hit the floor. And I didn't go unconscious. Now, I'll go on record for saying this. Pressure point wise, I have never been knocked out. Ever. And Professor Dillman has tried. And I'm pretty sure that if he really, really wanted to, he could put me out of my misery. But I haven't been knocked out, but I've been incapacitated to the point where the fight was over. And that's where we need to make a, deline uh, a, a, a side delineation. When you do pressure points, you're not got to get rid of the word knockout because we're not it's not in the context of how a boxer knocks a boxer out. It's not really a knockout. Sometimes that happens. It's such a neurological incapacitation that you just are either stunned and can't move, which any one of us can do, or you're just down on the ground and the fight's over. So. When we say knockout, people automatically, when they see those videos, have this concept, okay, you're going to watch the guy and he's going to pass out. He's going to fall down. He's going to be unconscious. No. Okay. You have just disrupted him so bad that the fight's over. And that's what he did to me. He hit me on a pressure point called stomach five on the jaw, which is the seventh branch of the facial nerve. And my brain went totally, I said it in a, a newspaper interview. If I could have the little birds floating around my head, like in the cartoons, <laughs> that's what it was. And he stood over me. He said, you believe me now? And I said, where do I sign up? You know, but it took that shock to me to convince me. Now, I've been the guy where other things in the Dillman organization that were criticized for the energy and all that stuff. I'm the first guy to raise my hand and say, I don't believe this. And I'm usually the first guy to end up on the ground. And experience it, you know, so for me, I believe in it and I believe in a lot of it because I've had firsthand experience with it. Other people don't believe in it and that's fine. That's t I'm totally cool with that. And because maybe you don't have firsthand experience with it, maybe just it didn't work for you, whatever. But that would be like me training in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and not being able to pull off a lying arm bar and saying, you know what? I don't believe it works. You know? It's just yeah. not, to me, it's not scientific. You know, I, I like people who can argue their point scientifically or intelligently. And, I'll, you know, like we all know the Internet trolls, you know, they start piping up on their computer. And some of the things like I had a, uh, a discussion with a guy who was a student at the University of Virginia Medical School. And we were talking about acupuncture and talking about how there was an article in a magazine called Cross Currents where they took two acupuncture needles and put them in on either end of a meridian and put an electric current through it. And they were able to actually, through a fluoroscope, see the actual pathway of the meridian. And he says, well, I can hook a pizza up to a, uh, an electrodes and, and get something. And I'm like, that was not even an intelligent statement. That, that, that just there's no science behind that. There's no significance behind it. It's just and then, you you know, those kind of people. It's not worth trying to change their mind. It's not worth trying to convince them. It's not, you know, being a pressure point guy, you walk into a seminar, you got a bullseye on your head. There's always at least one person that says, I don't believe that stuff works. And in the beginning, I used to try to convince them for a while. I used to be like, OK, you're the first guy I'm going to put my hands on. Now I'm like, OK. You know, that's fine if that's that's what you you want, you know, because martial arts is a personal journey for each and every one of us. We have our goals. We have our things that we want to get out of it. And we're not all going to have those same goals and those same things we want to get out of it. And it's not for me to tell somebody else. No, you need to you need to have the same goals and things that that I want to get out of martial arts. That's what you need to have. No. And as a teacher. That would stifle me as a teacher if I thought that every person walking in the door had to have my goals, my opinions, and my methodology. 
I, I, I wouldn't have very many students, you know? Right. Yeah. No, absolutely. So. And how effective is anything when you don't believe it's going to work? Exactly. Exactly. You know, we're starting to see all this research come out around, um, you know, I, I see it when I, I see research on cancer patients and the ones that think that it's, that their time is up have <laughs> such a higher mortality rate. Oh, you know, you can apply that to anything. If I don't think a kick is going to work, I'm not going to do it. <coughs> if I'm forced to do it or asked to do it, it's not going to work. Right. If I think I'm, it's going to work, then it might, right? I mean, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to, but it, if you don't believe something's going to work, it's probably not going to. So here's a, here is actually a kind of an interesting martial arts story that correlates with that. You were talking about having faith in techniques, having faith in what you do, right? Because those are the ones we're going to use, the ones that we have made work repeatedly and consistently. We have faith in them. So I had at one point when I was trying to mend a relationship with my father, we were out at this campground. I had gone out on the beach to work on my katas and whatnot. And he came, came over and he says, you know, because my father is extremely religious and uh, not that that's a bad thing. Okay, just. But uh, he says, I kind of think that when I see you like hit your students and knock them out, it's kind of like what my pastor does to me. And I said, you mean like this? And I hit him and I knocked him out. <laughs> and I actually did knock him out. He was he was pretty <laughs> out there. And when he woke up, I said, does it feel like that? He says, yeah, yeah. I go, it's not what I did to you that has an effect on your body. It's your faith. Now. You know, we all know the power of the mind. We've seen it statistically over and over and over again in medical science, how people have willed themselves healthy, how people have used laughter, positive thinking, all those other things to keep themselves alive. I have a friend who lives, uh, his name is Mike Demi. He was a uh, ninjutsu practitioner and he got thyroid cancer. They gave him a 10% chance of living even if he did chemotherapy. And he said, no, you know what? No, thank you. He started doing the macrobiotic diet and uh, microbiotic diet. He started going to live with the Indians in the hills and started learning Native American healing and all that stuff. This was probably 15 years ago. He's still alive. He's still cancer free. And he went to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and talked to them about how he did it. And most of the doctors said, well, we think you just got lucky. Now, flip that around. My mother just recently passed away of cancer. And I watched her wither away and die. But she had the mentality that she was going to die. And that she wanted to die. And that this was awful. And which it is. Don't get me wrong. Cancer is probably the nastiest thing I've ever seen somebody have to go through. But I've seen people who've had it and are just blow you away with their positive attitude and their mentality. And they've all outlived the projections of the doctors. I was just having a conversation with one of the moms of one of my preschool students. Um, I thought she was having cancer. She was having chemotherapy for cancer because she wears a bandana. She had a staph infection in her blood that almost killed her. That has now caused her to have scarlet fever and rheumatic arthritis. But the woman is the most bubbly person you've ever met. She has the most positive attitude. And she has two kids, little kids who have autism. And they're just awesome kids. And she's an awesome person. And the doctors did not think that did they, they basically had written her off. But she hadn't written herself off. And she's flourishing. She's getting better. So... It may be anecdotal to all these studies, but there's so many of them that we need to start paying attention to the power of the mind and the power of belief. There's a book called The Biology of Belief. Um, I don't know if you've ever read it, but there's, uh, it starts with a story about a man who in England, 35 years old, civil, war, civil servant worker who starts having migraine headaches. He goes, finally gets to the hospital, to the doctors, and has a uh, CAT scan of his, of his head. He only has 17% brain matter. All the rest of it is all fluid. Now, that goes against everything we've ever been taught 
physically, physiology wise, that you can't survive without your brain. If this guy had a normal IQ, average job, 35 years old, never had any health problems until then. Then it goes on to tell another story about a woman who had uh, was diagnosed with cancer. The doctors told her she had six months to live. And they she died six months later. And when they autopsied her, she didn't have cancer. She willed herself to die. Huh. Now, I've gone through my own health challenges where in one year I went to the emergency room 51 times because the doctors had planned this nugget in my brain that I had a weakness in one of the chambers of my heart. So every time I would get like, you know, weird chest pains or anything like that, because I had had a blood clot in my lung, um, that I was thinking I was something wrong with my heart and I'd end up in the emergency room. And because of the stress and the anxiety and all that stuff, I went through a lot of medical testing that I didn't need. And finally I said to myself, you know what? This isn't right. This isn't happening. There's nothing wrong with me. I'm perfectly healthy. There's nothing wrong with my heart. When I finally did get to see a cardiologist, 38 emergency rooms visits later, he's like, there's nothing wrong with your heart. He goes, you're absolutely healthy. You know, but those doctors, the people that we consider the experts planted that in my head and I believed it because they're supposed to be the experts as opposed to choosing my own path. And again, that goes to the martial arts. We have a lot of instructors that will tell my students all the time, if you're ever in front of a martial arts instructor and they say, you know what, this technique is guaranteed to work. You need to turn and walk the other direction because there's no guarantees. Now, if a martial arts instructor says, I've used this, I have a lot of faith in it, and then you use it and it works for you and you have faith in it, then it's what's going to work for you. So sometimes I believe that it's not necessarily the style that's effective. It's the person and their sole belief in what they can do. If you look at all those people that we look up to, Dillman, Jay, Prasis, uh, Bruce Jutnick, Bill Wallace, uh, Joe Lewis, all those guys, those were some people who had a total belief in what they can do. And it, maybe that's the defining quality. So we've got a pretty good idea about what what makes you tick? I mean, we're starting to see some some common threads come up for you among your martial arts training and your in your history. But what are you doing when you're not in the dojo? Uh, you have any hobbies? Any anything that you really enjoy? Um, a lot of hobbies, actually. Things I enjoy. Okay. The number one thing I enjoy the most um, is my family. Um, I have a amazing wife and daughter um, that put up with my antics on a regular basis, and uh, <laughs> I am I'm a person who loves to laugh. And I love to make people laugh. So there's a lot of antics that go on in my dojo. Anybody that's ever seen my YouTube videos will see one of, you know, all of a sudden there's a dance break in the middle of a kid's class. We all start dancing because that's what life's about. You know, it's there's so much humor in my dojo. A good example, as we talked about, there's some banging going on in the background. My dojo is right next to a Chinese restaurant which is totally stereotypical of a martial arts school. I'm trying to get a takeout window put in, but that's still in progress. But you can <laughs> hear them yelling. You can hear them chopping vegetables. You can hear them, you know, they're, what goes on in their day. And at first it bothered me, but now it's just kind of like there's a lot of humor in it. And if you listen, there's some pretty funny antics that go on next door. Um, but, you know, that, that's I love watching movies, especially action and comedies. Um, I enjoy spending time with my family. I love to travel. I don't like the process of traveling, but I like going to different places. I, one of the things I love, absolutely love, love, love about my job is when I travel, I teach a lot of seminars and I get to not only go to all these cool places, but I have friends all over the world now and I get to meet so many cool, interesting people and get to do such cool, interesting things. And like when I started traveling outside of the United States, I swore to myself that whatever country I went to, I would eat their food. I would immerse myself in their culture. You know, when they say, hey, what do you want to go see? I'm like, I don't want to go see the tourist traps. I want to go see what you see every day. Because to me, you see it every day, but I don't. It's something new and unique to me. So I've gotten to see some <clears throat> amazing old churches and buildings and castles and just 
blow your mind and I've gotten to eat some foods, which there is a downside to that. You go to a foreign country, you eat something you absolutely love and you can't get it here in our country. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, oh, oh what I would like cup of coffee. Because I've been in Europe a lot, coffee over here just doesn't even hold a candle to it. It's so sad. It's so sad. And you're going to have those coffee people. I love Starbucks or Dunkin' Donuts is great. And so you've had a cup of freshly roasted ground European coffee. Oh, yeah. So you just can't find it. I've heard others say the same. Yeah. Yeah. And what's funny is when I first went over there, I went to France for the first time. Um, I would come downstairs in the morning. My breakfast would be all laid out for me, which was kind of cool. That doesn't happen to me ever at home. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the woman pours me this little cup of coffee. And I said, I need a bigger cup of coffee. And she says, no, you don't understand. French coffee is stronger than American coffee. I said, no, you don't understand. I used to start my morning every morning then with two Red Bulls. She says, uh, let me get you a bigger cup of coffee. And got me a normal sized cup and I would drink that. And uh, that was one of the, the jokes when I was over there is that, you know, this American can drink a lot of French coffee. Um, but, yeah, I mean, other than that, I might, you know, my wife can voraciously read a book a day, like romance novels and things like that. I can't read a book like that to save my life, but I will devour books on knowledge and on learning things and um, especially martial arts. Uh, you know, martial arts is, I'm, I'm, I call myself a martial arts freak, um, because like we were in Walmart one day, my wife and I, and my daughter, and we ran into a gentleman guy named Peter Friedman, who you should have on the show. We're working on, um, it. and it was the first time I met Pete and we're, I, but we had heard about each other. So we started talking and my wife says, I'll be back in an hour. And she went off shopping. When she came back, we were still in the same spot, still talking about <laughs> martial arts. So you know, it's, it's a passion. It's something that, you know, it's like, I always say, uh, I'm at a stage right now where I'm, uh, have an upcoming hernia surgery and I'm having an upcoming hip replacement surgery. So I can't train right now, which is killing me. It's like, think of not showering or not brushing your teeth for days on end. You know, it's when you've had a life, a life of moving your body every day, and then you can't move your body. And your body just yearns for it. It, it. That's to me. So martial arts is always the overtone of everything I do. But I do have those other things. And what's funny, I don't enjoy most martial arts movies. I'm not the kind of guy that looks forward to the next Jackie Chan. Well, I do like Jackie Chan movies. But <laughs> like, you know, gets excited when Enter the Dragon is on. I'll watch it, but it's not like, ooh, this is the, you know. Because I have this different outlook on martial arts. So for me, it, it's, you know, and of course, being a martial artist yourself, you'll watch movies and go, that would never work. Or, you know, that's just not, you know, that's not what I do. Or so you start critiquing it. So I don't, I don't watch a lot of martial arts movies, but I love action movies, love comedy movies. Um, that's probably my biggest thing. Um, I like to cook. Not very well at it, but I do like to do it. Do you have a like favorite dish? I like to eat. <laughs> uh, I think we all like to eat. I don't, I don't know too many people that don't like to eat. My favorite not dish. A... I joke my dojo if my students want to bribe me. Sushi. Huh. Sushi. Oh, my goodness. Yes. You and me both. Yeah. So. So, you know, we've heard about some of these people that were influential. Your your first instructor and, and the big three, as you called them. But let's let's take those few people out. If I had to pin you down for the person who was the most influential on your martial arts career, who would that be? That's an interesting question. So, you know, I had a situation where a student of mine was competing in a tournament, and the night before the tournament, they were having a master's demonstration. And, you know, Boston, Massachusetts, you don't think it's going to be anybody – you know, who's who or whatever. And I look at the program and it's Fumio Demora, mm. uh, Takia Kubota, uh, Tadashi Yamashita, um, all those guys. Um, and by the way, as a side note, I met Chuck Norris when I was a kid. Chuck Norris, I love Chuck Norris when I was a kid. 
you know, like pretty much every martial arts person did. I liked him. Yeah. I actually liked him more than Bruce Lee. And uh, so I met him before he was a, uh, a movie superstar. Um, I was nine years old, Madison Square Garden at a tournament. And I didn't know he was this mega movie star. I just knew he was a martial arts superstar. Nicest guy in the world. Um, did not get his autograph. Just, you know, he talked to everybody and everything. I, I was, I'm, I've done that numerous times, met famous people and not had the brain to say, hey, can I have your autograph? You know, or can I have a picture taken with you? I'm getting better at that now because it's much easier with cell phones and all that stuff. But, you know, back then. So, you know, he was a big influence. Um, but those guys were some of my biggest influences. And I had the wonderful opportunity when I was in the military, I was stationed in California for a little bit. I had a wonderful opportunity to spend a week training with Sensei Demora and training a week with Sensei Kubota. Um, they were probably some of the most painful and uh, intense training I've ever had in my life. Um, but uh, yeah, that was that was pretty cool. Um, so they were, you know, they were some of uh, James Liu was also there and. Um, I've, I've since become uh, somewhat friends with James Liu. Uh, just an amazing guy. He he came down after doing his, his uh, he did a sword for him. He came down. He must have talked to me for about a half hour. Now, he didn't know me from a hole in the wall, but I literally felt like I'd known him my whole life. Um, and we, we talked to him. We got pictures with him. And just, just a, a, a real down-to-earth, cool guy, you know. Um, and then... I used to follow the days of kickboxing, PKA kickboxing. So you're talking about, you know, guys like Bill Wallace and uh, Joe Lewis. You know, I read, read about him, and I didn't meet uh, Bill Wallace until much later. Um, but I have met him and uh, met numerous times, and we've joked around, as most people do with Bill. Um, <laughs> some people, you know, some people don't like Bill. Other people love Bill. I love Bill. Guy can make me laugh. I love his his sense of humor. I love his, um, his outlook on life, just, just everything, you know? So, um, plus, you know, he's kind of an inspiration because I mean, let's look at, he's in his seventies. He's 70 and yeah. still doing his thing and still, and just the fact that he can eat like he eats and still <laughs> look like that. Come on now, you know, but it's cause the man trains constantly. Yeah, I know. Huh? You know, so, but, um, yeah, they were my big influences in my life. And, you know, so my my martial arts actually ebbed and flowed and the goals that I wanted based on a lot of that, you know, because you came, you know, the kickboxing days and I had done a lot of point competitive competition and stuff. So then kickboxing became something that I was kind of interested in because that seemed to be where martial arts was going and it would keep me in it and things like that, you know, so. You know, I, I started my first dojo when I was 16 years old, um, opened it over my parents' garage, and I had a handful of friends that I trained, and then we would get students here and there, and we didn't charge the lessons, um, we, not because of any altruistic thing other than the fact that you were training in an old barn that had no heat and no air conditioning, and you were basically my my sparring partners, my, my, my sparring dummies, and I didn't feel right charging people for that, you know, yeah. and it progressed because and I never opened a, 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 a storefront dojo because I always thought that the cost would kill me, you know, and I always thought the insurance was going to be like the most expensive thing. And so from age 16 until I opened my dojo here 16 years ago, so 30, age 30, 31, um, I, that's what I did. That's how I trained. You know, the good old barn days, some of my old students will talk about. And then my my grandmother passed away and left the family some money. And I used that to open the dojo. And we've been here 16 years now. And we're not, a, I, not by any shade of the imagination, a smashing success by industry standards. Um, we're a very small dojo. We want to keep it that way. Um, it pays its bills, but I'm not making the life of Riley, which I don't, I don't care. Um, yes, it'd be nice to provide the financial, you know, lifestyle that we all dreamed of, but Hey, I'm getting to do what I love doing for work. 
which most people can't say. And I joke all the time, we have the best job in the world. We get to wear our pajamas all day long, and we get to smack people around, and we get to change lives. You know, so how do you put a price tag on that? I don't know. But anyways. I don't um, think you can. So, but, you know, those were the those were the people that were my inspiration, so to speak. Great. Now, you mentioned competition in there. Tell, tell us a little bit more about <laughs> your time in the ring. I competed in all different forms of martial arts competition from age 8 to age 18. Part of the reason why my body is broke, damaged, and falling apart. Um, you know, just, I would basically go to, I didn't win any grandiose titles. Um, I would just go to any tournament that was around that was available. I remember the first tournament I competed in, I was nine years old. Um, actually, I was eight and a half years old, and uh, I lost. And my father, in no uncertain terms, reminded me of that consistently that I lost. So it kind of spurred me to better myself and, and not lose. Um, and I lost my share. I won my share. Um, you know, I, some of the most interesting broken bones I've ever gotten were in tournaments. I broke my shin in a tournament. You see those videos, you know, where the guys break their legs and stuff? Yeah. It wasn't that violent. I broke one. I broke the, um, the tibia. Um, in my leg from a roundhouse kick, we both collided <sighs> shins together and mine <sighs> broke. And that was six months of crutches and subsequent, yeah, um, fingers, ribs, nose, the works, you know, and martial arts is making an evolution from point sparring to, um, the, especially the Korean systems. They were starting to do the, uh, trembling shock. Where you had to hit yep. your opponent hard enough to make them take a step backwards, or you could knock them out. Um, to continuous sparring, to you know, it was it was almost like martial arts was trying to find the perfect niche, and uh, as to what was the best kind of competition. So it was before UFC and all that other stuff. So um, I did that until I just until I was eighteen years old, and I just couldn't do it anymore. Just couldn't do it anymore. And I was seeing a de-evolution of sportsmanship and uh, just the, the level of competition. I'm not saying that people were stinking, but um, you were just seeing, like I remember uh, Boston Asian Fest, uh, uh, Boston Asian International that goes on down here in uh, Wilmington, Mass. And the last time I was there, there were some competitors that a uh, Canadian guy got punched in the face, injured his nose. And then they watched subsequent matches that he competed in. Every time the coach for the other team would point to his nose, like signaling to his student, punch him in the nose. Mm. You know, and to me, that's not really good sportsmanship. Yeah, and, uh, no, that's... you know, it, it, the violence, it just escalated and the sportsmanship was gone. And when you start seeing parents coming out and yelling at judges and coaches coming out and yelling at judges, you know, it was it, it, it was what it was. Let's face it, in some of the point competitions, you know, some of the competitions we go to, the scoring may have been unfair or whatever, but you know what it was? It was, okay, you just got to train so your skill level is high enough that that overshadows any unfairness that goes on. You know, to that just, that, not saying that people are making excuses for losing, but that's making an excuse for losing. Right. So. Yeah. So that's why I stopped. And we don't, our students, we don't encourage them to compete. Um, our martial arts is not a competitive martial art by any shade of the imagination. Um, it's more geared towards protecting yourself and keeping yourself safe um, and keeping yourself healthy. So, but if students do, we do have a, a competition class. If students are interested in that, I do work with them on that. Um, so there you go. Okay. That, that kind of rounds that out, yep. gives, gives us an idea. I mean, you've got all these different components that we're tying together as we walk through. Now, you've mentioned some pretty impressive names. In fact, you're the, the caliber of people that you've been fortunate enough to train with and, and meet. It's just kind of blowing my mind. Um, you may know, listeners may know that I'm constantly taking notes as we have these conversations and... There's a section on this sheet that I use for 
people that are of note that we tag the show notes pages with. And, and actually, for anybody that might be new to listening to the show, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find all these show notes over there. And this is probably the longest list that I've ever had to write down. Uh, and I think that that's a great thing. But if we were to take out all of these wonderful people that you've trained with, if we, I was to ask you, who would you want to train with that you haven't? Who would, who's left? Who would you want to work with? You know, that, that's an interesting question because um, Professor Price, Professor J, I did not get a lot of time with that I would have liked to have. They, made, they were in my life long enough to make an impact and do some training with. But, you know, uh, Professor Prasis was even shorter. I think I only got to train with him for about a year and not like as a personal student or anything like that. And Professor J, um, probably three or four years. Um, and, you know, I had... So when I got promoted to my 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 current rank, um, when Professor Dillman gave me the plaque, he said that Wally J had asked that his signature be on my certificate. And the date on my certificate is dated earlier than when I actually got promoted. Um, and Professor Dillman couldn't look at me and I couldn't look at him when he said that because we both probably would have started tearing up. Um, yeah. But... You know, if I had had more time with both of those, I would love to have, like, really, really, really trained with them. Um, I'm fortunate enough to still be able to train with Leon and with um, some of the other high guys in small circle. And also with Kent Smith, who is another person you might want to consider putting on the show. Um, he is one of the masters of Tappy Tappy. Um, incredible instructor, incredible teacher, um, incredible sp- He's, I consider now my stick teacher, uh, my Arnie's teacher. Um, but I would probably say uh, the people that I would love to have trained with that are gone, Mori Ueshiba would have been high on my list. Um, Adrian and Prando um, of Kaiju Kempo. Um, you know, just the people that Ed Parker would be another one. Innovators, mm-hmm. people that you know, they didn't just mimic a style. They didn't just mimic a teacher. They became something. They became martial arts, so to speak, you know. And I think that's that's something that is happening that's, that's slowly fading away. And especially as martial arts became more and more of a business. Now, you have to look at a lot of these guys. This was not their livelihood. This was not their business. So they came at it from a different perspective, you know, um, not saying that it shouldn't be a business. And I'm not saying that people that run martial arts schools, cause I run one of my own, um, are any less than these people. It's just, there was a different way of looking at martial arts and a different way of looking at what you were doing. So there's just p- some pure genius in, in those people. And that those would be the kind of people that I would love to have had the opportunity to study with, you know, I mean, I've had some pretty interesting people come in and out of my martial arts life that, you know, it just blows me away that I, I had the opportunity to stand in front of this person or even have a conversation with that person, you know? And to me, that's like, a high, you know, some people, you know, what are the highlights of your life? Well, I graduated from high school or I did this or I did that. Mine are, you know, I got to meet this guy. You won't even know who I'm talking about unless you're a martial arts person, but, you know, that, that to me is, is probably the journey that I would love to have. And even just to be able to, like a good example, one that's still alive that I would love to train with, uh, Mori Higuana, the Okinawan uh, Gojiru master that pounds rocks with his hands and stuff. Mm, and just yeah. the fact that he's like in his 70s also and still going strong, but you see him teach. And the, the difference you see with some of the Okinawan teachers, there's a lot of smiles on their faces. They smile a lot when they teach. It's not that stoic, you know, serious look on their face all the time. You know, it, it's there. You see their humanity and their personality come through in what they do. So I think that to me, I don't know if that answers your question or not. <laughs> Absolutely. 
These are all open ended, you know. You yeah. Take them in whatever direction you want. <laughs> <laughs> so, you've mentioned that you you're a reader, maybe not at the speed that your your wife is, but you love martial arts books and knowledge yeah. and history. Are there any books that you might suggest for the listeners? Oh, yeah. Um, well, I'd be remiss if I didn't say all of Professor Dillon's books. <laughs> Uh, actually, his last book, Prometheus, is a pretty interesting read because it's not a martial arts book, so to speak. It's it's like a slight autobiography. And I was there for a lot of the interviews for that. They left a lot out of that book that was just fascinating. Um, I read a lot of <clears throat> um, – for me, I read a lot of acupuncture books and a lot of traditional Chinese medicine books and things. That fascinates me too. Um, but I would definitely – if you don't have The Way of Karate in your book library, which is uh, Masoyama's book, you have to read that one. Um, and then there's some really, really excellent books written by um, Tadashi Nakamura, who is the founder of Sado Karate. And there's My Karate, My Way. Um, that would be one. Um, and that is more of his journey through martial arts. Um, and then, of course... You'd be remiss if you didn't read Jackie Chan's autobiography. Oh, my goodness. Um, you know, just his life. You know, it, I think that to really understand a martial arts instructor or a martial arts personality, you have to learn about their life. What drives them? What motivates them? What caused them to create or do what they do? You know, mm -hmm. um, yeah. again, going back to and not to keep harping on people that internet trolls or people that bash professor Dillman. But a lot of those people, when you talk to them, they don't know anything about his previous history, but his previous background. They don't know that, you know, that, that he was a golden gloves boxer before he got involved in martial arts. They don't know that he was a captain in the army, um, in charge of the military police during the race riots during the Vietnam war. Um, they don't know that, you know, some of the things that he did and some of the things that about his life and, you know, I know way more, I'm, I'm a big, the other person that not a martial arts that I would love to sit and talk with Muhammad Ali. I love Muhammad Ali and I love Muhammad Ali from hearing stories of professor Dillman and Ali's interactions and exchanges. And then, uh, um, professor Dillman just recently sold it. But he owned Muhammad Ali's training camp in Deer Lake, Pennsylvania. And for almost 16 years, I would go four, five, six times a year to train there. So I learned a lot about Ali and a lot about the history that went behind that. And then I started reading a lot of books on, on that and uh, learning about him. So that would be another person I would love to sit down and talk with. But, you know, you, you can't take a measure of a man by looking at a glimpse on YouTube or – uh, a, a DVD that you bought in the mail and make a judgment on that person. You have to sit down and, and talk to people. I have a, a guy who comes in to visit me and I'm not going to say his name because every time I do, he does come by and visit me. It's like we, we joke, we sometimes call him he who shall not be named. And we all know who we're talking about. He's a very <laughs> high level Tai Chi grandmaster, not your typical Tai Chi teacher. Um, he has a tendency to, when he's teaching you, throw books at you and yell at you and tell you to never get it because you're not Chinese and, and whatnot. And he's rough around the edges. But when you talk to him and you get to know him and you get past that, there's a depth to his personality and a, a knowledge that is fascinating. It's just fascinating. And once you get past that bravado that he puts out there and he gets to know you, then you get to know the real person and know who he is. And yeah, I mean, it's fat. It, it's, I have a whole different aspect or, or way of looking at him than other people do. So, so what's keeping you going? You know, you're still training, you're still teaching, you're still passionate about the martial arts. Are there goals? Or are there things you're working towards? You know, it's funny. <laughs> I was asked that. Um, so when I got promoted to ninth degree, somebody sent me an email and said, so now that you've reached the top of DKI, what's your future? And I said, well, you know, I've kind of 
kind of, you know, done a lot in that craft. So now I want to learn other arts. Like right now, I'm really, really exploring a lot uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and the Filipino martial arts. I want to learn more because there's just, I think that's what keeps me going is there's always something to learn. There's always something to challenge me. Um, I'm not the kind of person that's complacent. I can't not challenge myself. I can't not, and not for anything other than I need to know what I'm capable of. And I need to know that when I leave this world, that one, I've made an impact in someone's life, but two, that I, I lived within my potential and I lived up to my potential and maybe possibly pushed beyond it, um, for myself. A good example, uh, so I did Tom Callis's ultimate black belt test. And at the time when I did it, I was not, there was, they couldn't promote me to another rank. And I was told that, and I said, I don't care. I just want to do the process because mm -hmm. for me, it's the process that, that you learn and you, you grow. Um, and another thing, and I'm going to brag a little bit about myself, which I don't like to do. Um, so in 2002, St. Jude's hospital approached us to do a board breaking fundraiser. Every dojo does it. And I said to myself, well, you know, if we do it, it's only going to be in our dojo. A lot of people won't know about it. We won't, you know, we won't raise that much money. So I got this wild idea in my head that I wanted to break 3,000 boards. And I wanted to try to do it as fast as I could. And so began the process of doing this. So we ended up, we could not get 3,000 boards. We got 2,148 of them. I broke them in 31 minutes nonstop. I should have got a prize for being the most swollen human being on the face of the planet. <laughs> um, they, my students called me Mickey Mouse fingers for about two weeks. Um, and we were, this was all by hand. Yeah. No, no elbows, uh, hand, feet, elbows. So when my hands would get too hurt, I would do a couple boards with my elbows or do a couple boards. With my, what we did is we had 10 stacks of 10 on one side on cinder blocks with a half inch spacers in between. Then we'd have students holding boards, two boards at the end. Then we'd do 10 stacks of 10 down the other side. We just keep going around in that circle. And uh, there were some complications to it. It was outside in August in like 80 degree weather. And uh, the it was all on the grass. So the, the cinder blocks would move. So sometimes I would hit those. Um, and what we did to for speed, because we were going for speed, is that we put a drop of wood glue on the spacers. So you could just lift up the whole stack of 10. What we didn't realize is we basically I-beamed every stack. So sometimes I would go through five and I have to go through the five I just broke to break the other five. Or I finally got to the point, I said, I can't do 10 anymore. We only got to do five. So they would have to stick a board in there and snap the stack apart so I could actually uh. have the five. So, you know, it was just abusive and, and crazy. And my family said, if I ever try to do it again, they'll throw rocks at me. But, you know, there were two moments when I was doing it, where I was like, you know what, I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm going to stop. But then the immediate next question in my head was, what message does that send to all these people that are watching about martial arts, about black belts, about everything? So I just kept going and, and I did it. But I didn't set any world records, apparently. Um, we did try to submit it to Guinness, but at the time Guinness said that they were no longer accepting records for board breaking because it was a little no merit or achievement was their exact words. Um, and there was no other governing bordering like that. But anyways, um, it wasn't about setting a world record. It was about doing something good for a cause St. Jude's, but also about just pushing myself to do that. And, you know, after you accomplish something like that, it's not necessarily the feeling of pride and bravado. It's the feeling of, hmm, I pushed myself and I was able to do it. What else could I push myself and do? You know, it's that that goes back to that message of being fearless, of, of trying, you know, and of not being afraid to fail and fall on your face and, and look ridiculous. So yeah. um, side story on that. I was the first time I ever met Bruce Jutnick was at one of the gatherings. Okay. And so they asked me during the lunch break to do some impromptu knockouts, pressure point knockouts, which I did four of them completely failed at doing them. Nothing happened. Okay. And even was teased a little bit by Bruce Jetnick about this is how you 
don't knock somebody out. <laughs> um, which, you know, I took as, you know, my skills were not up to par. I needed to work on things. I needed to improve. And also it started questioning my head. Is this like a guaranteed thing, which it's not, which for me, when I teach pressure points, I don't focus on the knockouts. Okay. The knockouts are a way of demonstrating the effectiveness or, um, the gravity of what you're doing. Okay. And people sometimes lose the message in the seminar because they see those knockouts and they like, you know, I used to go to seminars and afterwards people, you see that knock guy, knock that guy out, see this. And I said, yeah, but did you see that awesome, cool technique where you were trying to struggle with an arm bar? And if you tweak this nerve, now you could do it. They didn't see that. They just caught up in the show part of the knockouts. Now, a lot of guys in our organization do focus on knockouts. And unfortunately, that's the show. It really is a demonstration in a show, just like the whole no touch knockout was supposed to just be a demonstration or an exploration. Is this possible? Does this exist? We never once ever said we would use this. Well, at least Dillman didn't and I didn't ever say, oh, we're going to replace punching and kicking and all that stuff with this boogie boogie going to fall down stuff. No, that's not the that wasn't the, the goal or the the drive for it. So the pressure points are the same thing. We're not trying to do these knockouts. We're trying to show you how to add a skill set to your martial arts that may make it more effective, may make it easier as you get older um, or not as strong. And, you know, it's uh, so when we teach in the dojo, you got to teach us good, solid techniques. So if you're teaching an armbar, you got to teach that student all the fine mechanics of doing an armbar. When they can do all those fine mechanics of doing an armbar, then you show them where to add the pressure points in to make it simpler and more effective. So, like, I used to work with Professor Dave Castoldi, and uh, when I first met Professor Castoldi, he says in his gravelly voice, I don't know if you ever met Dave Castoldi. No, I haven't. He has, so Professor Dave Castoldi was a wrestler in the pre-WWE, WWF days. The man's hand is the size of my face, <laughs> and he's got this big gravelly voice, and there's this legend story about three guys tried to mug him. And he beat the snot out of him and threw him in a dumpster. So he'll call you up sometimes and say, oh, you know, call me back or I'll throw you in a dumpster, you know. But <laughs> um, so I meet him and he's like, oh, you're one of those Dillman guys. Can you knock me out? And I did. And after I knocked him out, he's like, we should work together. So I would go down once a month to his dojo and he'd show me his knife techniques and his knife defenses and small circle and Castoli streetwise self-defense. And I would show him pressure points. And whatnot. And he called me up one day and he says, I'm breaking all my guys. And I said, yes, professor, that's because you had really good jujitsu techniques. And I just showed you how to turn off the muscles that they're using to protect against your techniques. He says, well, I like it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, you know, that's that's the, the, the whole thing. I went into this gathering and I was going to teach pressure points. And oh, my goodness, that was my some of my earlier days where. There are a lot of guys that were doing pressure points that were like, if you're not doing pressure points, you you don't know anything about martial arts. You are just missing the bus. And I was one of those guys. And I walked in there thinking I was going to show everybody something that would blow them away. And I blew them away by not knocking anybody out. You know, and it fell flat on my face. And it was a learning experience for me. It was very, very good. So, you know, I, um, again, I'm one of the, guys in the organization, I do not do any planned or prepared knockouts. If you see a video of me knocking somebody out, it was, I took an opportune moment to just do it. I just follow the principles and the philosophies that we teach and the techniques, and I just do it. And sometimes they work, sometimes they don't. But if you ever see most of my knockouts that I, I or incapacitations I do, on YouTube or whatever, they're on the fly right off the cuff. That's why I have a lot of faith in what I do because, and I don't, I try not to use people that are my students. I try not to use people that I know. You know I mean, it's kind of hard if you've been around for a long, long time, the seminars, you pretty much know everybody that's there, you know? Right. So, but I don't, I don't pick certain people because, oh, I know this guy that'll work on this guy. You know, it's like, especially when I was traveling around the world and teaching a lot. I, I didn't know any of these people. So really we're just flying without a safety net whatsoever. 
but I didn't care because, you know, that was going to be what it was going to be. So, um, so my goals in martial arts are to continue to learning, to continue to teach because I just love teaching. I love to watch how people change when they do martial arts. Um, and just, I would love to love to love to see martial arts become the brotherhood that it is deeper because I mean, you develop an instant trust and an instant bond with a training partner on the map because where else can you go where you meet somebody, shake their hand and say, you know what? I'm going to trust you with my physical safety. Yeah. You don't. It doesn't, it doesn't happen very often. No. So you build these bonds and these brotherhoods and these friendships that go deeper than, than a lot of other things. I'd love to see that more. I'd love to see people stop bashing each other, start lifting each other up, stop critiquing each other on every little thing and start looking for, and that's something that Bruce Jetnick said to me, one of the first times I trained with him at a seminar and taught with him at a seminar was look for the similarities, stop looking for the differences, start looking for the similarities. And you know, the, the joke about how many martial arts does it take martial arts does it take to change a light bulb? All of them one to turn the bulb and the rest to say, well, in my style, right. you know, Stop doing that and start going, hmm, that might be another way that I could do that technique that I do in my style. And maybe it'll work better or maybe it'll work in this circumstance better. You know, um, Tony Anisi is another great guy that I've had the chance to to train with in some seminars. Same guy he will say not every technique I'm going to show you is going to work on every person. I admire that about him. I admire that that he's ca that candid that can say that. And he actually came up and, and there was a move that my partner was trying to do on me. And Tony said to him, it's not going to work on Matt. He's, he's a bigger guy. It's just not going to work. You got to do this. You got to tweak it. You got to adapt and change. So I, again, that brought him up another notch in my, in, in respect and, and, and wanting to learn from him. So. Hmm. Now, if now, if anybody wants to get a hold of you, maybe they're, they're near, your dojo in New Hampshire, if they, you know, want to book you for a seminar, any of these things, how would people get a hold of you and learn what you've got going on? Oh, good God. It, how can you people not get a hold of anybody anymore? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my dojo is in Pentecook, New Hampshire, which is on the outskirts of Concord. Um, it's nothing spectacular, but we always have an open door policy. Anybody's always welcome. If you walk in the door and you have the mindset that, hey, I want to visit, I want to share, I want to train, I want to learn, I want to share what I know. And you're not coming in here with an ego and a bravado and, you know, wanting to throw down. Anybody's welcome to come in here and and train and do whatever. Um, I am available for seminars. I do do a lot of seminars all over the place. Um, so they can either, you know, best way to get a hold of me is through email, which is psgrady at msn.com. Um, because, you know, with iPhones and smartphones and stuff, your email's always with you. Um, and I was one of those people that I wasn't very good at texting. I do like to text a lot now. And I do see the, the value of texting and email. A lot of people are like, I like to have that phone conversation. I actually don't like talking on the phone. It's not my favorite thing. Because if I talk to you on the phone, it's either going to be a very short, brief conversation that we're going to meet somewhere. Or it's going to be a very long conversation because I haven't caught up with you in a long time. And we're going to talk for hours. Any of my friends will tell you I suck at getting back to people. Um, if you oh, by phone, but you'll almost get an instant response from me on text or email because it allows you to have a conversation when it's convenient for both parties. You know the the joke that the cable company guy always comes just when you step in the bathroom or just when you go in the shower, it's the same mentality that phone always rings when you can't answer it. You got a mouthful of food or you're in the bathroom or you're teaching class, you know? So, uh, email at PS karate at msn.com or Facebook. Um, you can Facebook me or Instagram. I'm on Instagram. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Snapchat. Although I don't, ever do anything on Snapchat because my face is too ugly to put on Snapchat. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm just not a photogenic guy, so you're not going to see a lot of that. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, any of the social medias. But basically, uh, our website is pentacookkarate.com. 
and there are links to all our social media, but you can pretty much get a hold of me anyway, but the best way is through that email. Okay. And of course, we'll link to all that over the show notes, whistlekickmarshartsradio.com, if anybody wants to get a hold of you. And you mentioned your YouTube channel, so maybe we can find a couple of fun videos to share of you well, this- knocking people out or not knocking people out. <laughs> or- the dance video. I highly like dance parties. Dance <laughs> So, yeah, for a while I was doing a, uh, like a YouTube vlog every day, every week. It was called the Fat Matt Transformation Chronicle. <laughs> I put on some weight and I was actually trying to shed it. And it, it's a look, see, into not only gym training and dojo training, but classes and life and whatnot. It's on hold right now. Like I said, I'm pretty much out of commission until the beginning of the new year. Um, like I said, I'm, I'm having hernia surgery and then I'm going right into having hip replacement surgery. So I've got a recovery time for that. Um, I've been blessed with having some great students who have taken the reins of the dojo and kind of taken that on. But I tried to pull along in as long as possible. But on the advice of people like Bill Wallace, I need to join the artificial hip club and uh, get it done. So you'll be a cyborg. I mean, that's pretty yes, cool. Exactly. I'm working towards becoming bionic. That'd be awesome. So, that's, Maybe that's, that's how I'll live that. to be a hundred and. Hundred plus, <laughs> you can be you. You can be the six million dollar man. That's right. That's right. So, great. Um, well, I I really appreciate your time, and we always go out on the highest of possible notes. Any advice for the people listening? Uh, just uh, you know, I have a moniker for everybody has to have like a mission statement or a motto or whatever. Mine is um, train, inspire, and live. It's train hard, inspire others, and live your life to the fullest. And I'm really, people just need to stop getting caught up in the my style is better than your style, or I can beat you up, or whatever. Because when you do that, you put on these blinders that prevent you from seeing the amazing capability and the amazing accomplishments that everybody is possible of doing in the martial arts and beyond the martial arts. You know, what they say that only 7% of the world's population trains in martial arts. You know, Mm -hmm. so right there, you've put yourself in an echelon of a minority of people that are doing something that nobody else does. And that's something special. And so treat your martial arts training, teach your, treat your training partners and your teachers as something special because they're actually taking an interest in a, in a, in a part in your life. Um, Very quick story. When I was in fifth grade, I would skip school a lot. Um, Yeah, I'm a choir boy. Yeah. Um, But I would skip school (laughs) a lot and I I would leave school and I just wouldn't come home. Well, one day my teacher, and to this day I remember his name, Mr. Grolo, because of this one thing. He showed up at my house and dragged me back to school. And I sat in the principal's office and I was very upset about the whole thing. And the principal said something to me that would stick with me for the rest of my life is that if he didn't care about you, if he didn't give a crap about you, he wouldn't have come and done that. He would have just let you slide through the cracks. So these people that are teaching you and these people that are training with you, if they didn't care about you, they wouldn't give you the time of the day and they would just let you fall through the cracks. You know, and the other moniker I have that my my first teacher used to always tell me is that there is greatness inside of every single person. You just either need help to find it or a way to find it. Thank you for listening to episode 118 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Concho Brown. Over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, you can find photos and links to everything Concho Brown talked about, including his social media and the titles for those great book picks he offered. You can follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, YouTube, and Instagram, and our username is Whistlekick. If you want to know what's going on behind the scenes of this show, please check out our sort of secret but not quite Facebook group, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio behind the scenes. Why do we say it's kind of secret? Because it's not a public group. We've got to we've got to add you. So just search for Whistlekick. You'll see two results come up. One is our fan page. We hope you like that. But then we've also got this great group. We're always open to new guests for the show. So if you want to throw your hat in the ring, or perhaps your instructor or someone else that you know, head on over to the website whistlekickmartialartsradio.com and fill out the form. If you have any feedback, we'd love to hear it. And you can do that on the website as well. If you like the show, make sure you're subscribing. And you know we're always asking for reviews because they really help us spread the word of the show and push us up in the rankings, which helps new people find the show. And the cycle continues. 
If you like what we're doing, this really is the best way to help us out. Remember the products you can find at whistlekick.com, like our premium sparring gloves. And if you're a school owner or team coach, remember wholesale.whistlekick.com. That's all for today. So until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.